Now we will on with the next session. I would like to invite Professor Amrendra Kumar Thakur, who is an, an, a professor and a former head in the Department of History, Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, Mikalaya, India. He served as the General Se Secretary of Northeast India History Association from 2007 to 2019. He has also been the president of Arunachal Pradesh College Teacher Association and a member of the Executive Committee of the Indian History Congress. He is the author of five well-known books and he has also edited several volumes of other publications. Professor Thakur's important publications include India and the Afghan, a study of neglected region, slavery in Arunachal Pradesh, pre-colonial Arunachal Pradesh, technology of the tribe of Northeast India. Sir, we welcome you. And uh, I would like to hand over the session to you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Mausan. Thank you. And who are the paper presenters? Yes, sir. Paper presenters? Yeah, the paper presenters. You want me to read, sir? So the first uh, presenter for the session is uh, Atok Pam Marconi Singh. A research scholar, junior research fellow, Department of Political Science, Manipur University, Chanchipur. And the uh, title of, uh, the, of uh, his paper is uh, Student Uprising in Manipur, a case study of all Manipur students union, AMSU. Okay, good. Yeah. So, so are you on the line? <laughs> okay. Uh, how many minutes uh, we give to paper presenters, Mausan? Uh, ten minutes each, sir. Ten minutes. Okay, ten minutes. It's okay. Yes. So your your time starts now. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. A very good afternoon to one and all. Uh, my name is Asoka Marconi Singh, research scholar, Department of Political Science, Manipur University, Kanchipur. First of all, I'd like to express my humble gratitude to the respective chairperson of this technical session, sir. The title of my real paper is Student Uprisings in Manipur, a case study of the Old Manipur Students' Union, AMSHU. And the present paper aims to explore the roles and contributions of the AMSHU in the socio political movements of Manipur during the last 54 years of its existence. And I'll try to sum up the basic themes of the paper within the stipulated time. As we know, the world has experienced the emergence of student uprisings against the existing socio political system of their respective society. Such movements have become a significant phenomenon in the social political system of almost all the countries of the world. Scholars have defined the term student uprisings in different ways, but the study would like to take up the view of Philip Albright. He said that it is a collective expression of ideas by students to create a politically pertinent uh, debate on a topic and seek to bring about significant social, cultural, and political change. Various factors have contributed to the rise of student uprisings worldwide. However, their often confrontation with the sociopolitical issues has been the chief reason for it. It makes them to analyze the existing problems from various perspectives. Sometimes they become radical and come up as generational representatives with the idea to fight collectively against such issues. History gives ample testimony to the progressive role of the student uprisings taking place worldwide. Some of the glaring events where students' role has inspired the future generations are the civil rights struggle of U.S., Cuban Revolution, Japanese Revolution, Berkeley Space Peace Movement, May Revolt of France, and the Vietnam War protests, so the uprising of South Africa, Belgrade Revolution of Czechoslovakia, Tiananmen Square, aided, aided uprising of Rangoon, Children's Penguin Revolution. Very recently, the Central Movement of Taiwan and Umbrella Movement of Hong Kong are World Man Thinker. Coming to the context of Manipur, the state has been stated with many issues and challenges related to the social political system. In such a scenario, the student community is substantially influenced by happenings in the society. They are not lagging behind the counterparts in other parts of the globe. They acted as significant force in the struggles related to the social political issues of the state. In Manipur, the idea of collectiveness among the students was born during British colonialism. However, the first significant Events of the student uprising in Manipur took place in 1965. Uh, the people of Manipur in general, and there are four people in particular, were facing artificial famine life situation at that time at such a critical juncture. The students came out from the institutions and took a leading role in the movement, demanding the immediate redress of the severe scarcity of rice. It became evident that their right to life was a far more significant and immediate concern than academic interest. They strongly reacted against the federal administration for creating this artificial famine-like situation. During the genuine protest, the rightful 
demand for food was responded with brutal soldiers with the firing of bullets on 27 August 1965 three students volunteers and one AIR staff sacrificed their lives and became the martyrs of the world one student who suffered injuries in the incident also expired a month later this bloody tragedy saw the seeds for establishing the all manipur students union on the next day as a mark of remembrance the student fraternity led by the mshu has been observing the history and season of that particular day as the hunger march day since its inception the mshu continued to participate in almost all the major movements of manipur with the merger of manipur into the indian union in 1949 the people started demanding their fundamental political right that is the right to self government the major political parties launched series of agitations against the denial of democratic ideals to the people of manipur the mshu led the student community to play a dynamic role in this movement demanding the full budget status for manipur thousands of students using a black flag from the island shouting shouting the granting of statehood to manipur uh, in 1969 when the then indian prime minister gave her speech at imphal the day marked the most intense agitation of the movement the union supported the struggle for the democratic rights of manipuri people till the last in the late 1970s the mshu started focusing on activities to eradicate the celebration of religious uh, functions from the educational institutions in manipur It strongly condemned the observation of such religious functions, saying that Manipur, being a part of secular India, should not organize such religious functions in academic institutions. In 1970, it is submitted a letter to the Chief Minister of Manipur for abolishing such functions, and they finally agreed to ban the observation of religious functions. At the beginning of 1980s witnessed the movement against the influx of illegal immigrants in the state. The MSU, along with the AMCO, were highly concerned about the increasing threat posed by the influx of outsiders. They demanded the detection of illegal immigrants and their deportation to their respective homelands, areas, the slogan and call back foreigners. They launched series of agitations with the distribution of leaflets, pamphlets, and booklets while carrying out the agitation. Two students received bullet injuries in an open firing incident on 17 and 18 April 1980 and sacrificed their lives. Later on 30 April 1980 another two students were died by drowning in the Imphal river while while trying to escape from the police the MSU and AMCO intensified the movement later they signed an agreement with the government of Manipur to identify the illegal immigrants however the government had failed to implement them the movement was again emerged in 1994 the MSU signed an agreement with the government of Manipur and a committee was formed to detect the illegal immigrants in the state another issue taken up by the Another issue taken up by the MSU in the late 1980s had been the language movement. The primary goal of it was to include the Manipuri language in the eighth schedule of the Indian Constitution. The MSU played a dynamic role in making the movement a political issue. The MSU and the like-minded organizations formed the Manipuri Language Demand Coordinating Committee as a common platform to lead the movement. The MSU organized a campaign to use Maiti Ayaka characters on the posters and signboards of the shops and establishments in many parts of the Imphal Valley. The movement became intense in 1992. Uh, finally, uh, in the same year, the Union government passed the 71st Constitutional Amendment Act to include the Manipur language in the eighth schedule of the Constitution. In Manipur, the rise of the armed race movement resulted in the imposition of armed forces special power in 1958 in the year 1980 to extend extra powers to deal with the incident problems effectively but it is not surprising to say that the draconian characters of the act has no debate under this act many people of manipur have faced serious incidents of human rights violation including oh, any group my my other colleague here but they were also strong in safeguarding the violation of human rights of the people of manipur under the federal protest law Many students became the victims of untold incidents. Some of the unforgettable incidents include the killing of uh, a Jonathan Hart secondary school student in the year 1996 while waiting for a bus in the cross street incident. The fourth disappearance of Jumlan Bumsanamat, a student at Jaman High School, was arrested by the personnel of seven, 17 Ras rifles in 1990 and Thompson Lampar massacre of 1999, where 10 civilians, including three students, were shot dead by the sharpshooters. In the above. incident the amshu and other bodies loans intense agitations and demanded the withdrawal of the upper staff from manipur the most intense agitation demanding the removal of the black girl was the incident of self immolation of payam sitranjan mangan a student activist 
in 2004 August against the killing of uh, women by the uh, personnel of the 17 Assam Rifles. Following the continuous uh, protests, the government of Manipur withdrew the air from seven assembly segments of the Imphal municipal area. Another movement uh, that the MSU played an important role has been the movement for safeguarding the territorial integrity of Manipur. In 1968, the Union submitted a letter to the Indian Prime Minister with a strong commitment to protect the state's territorial integrity to the one that is to harm the integrity of the state with the territory of 1997. The MSU raised the despair agreement between the government and the United States. On 4 August 1997, it played a significant role in organizing history integrity rules in the from the year 2001. In the course of the education, leaders of the MSU were sent to prison besides the Union of 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 the the Union of 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 Condemning the policy of the union to hide the details of the agreement, the union reminded it not to create communal hatred among the indigenous peoples of Manipur. Under this campaign, the MSU some at the offices of different political parties of Manipur demanding a white paper on the agreement. As mentioned earlier, the union had already launched the MSU foreign movement. However, the agreement signed with the MSU and the government of Manipur were never implemented thereafter. The union and other civil bodies had dealt into focus the movement demanding the implementation of ILC system. From 2012 onwards, the Joint Committee on LCS spearheaded the movement, the MSU, as a part of the JCLC student wing, actively took part in the education. And one student, volunteer from Robin Hood, died in a violent struggle with the police uh, in July 2015. Following the long-standing protest, the government of Manipur passed the three bills related to the movement on August. 2015, but the president of India would have them. The air stations continue pressing their demands to modify the bills and reintroduce them in the house. Finally, the central government uh, extend, <coughs> announced to extend the LC system in the northeast India, including Manipur. However, the JCLCS still urges that government to regulate such guidelines to serve the interests of outsiders. The last issue that the paper has taken up is the movement against the Citizenship Amendment Bill 2019. In the year 2015, the central government proposed a draft amendment of the City and State Amendment 8, 1955. In 2016, the Lok Sabha introduced, it, introduced the City and State Amendment Bill 2016 to facilitate Indian citizenship to immigrants uh, belonging to five uh, these minorities from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. The Northeast Students Organization, an apex body of eight students union of the Northeast, including the AMSU, came to the forefront in the widespread agitation. The MSU as a constant body of the national self protest against the bill. In May 2018, it submitted a letter to the Chief Minister of Manipur, stating that the bill will give a significant blow to Manipur and other parts of Northeast India. However, uh, the Lok Sabha passed the City Amendment Bill 2019 on 8 January. The MSU actively participated in the widespread agitation, both inside and outside the state. It called upon the people of Manipur to stay united and oppose the bill. As against the extreme atrocities of police towards uh, this uh, volunteer uh, of the movement in Tripura and Manipur, the six student bodies, including the AMSU, observed the Black Day with a black flag hoisted at the AMSU headquarters. Uh, the students of Manipur also staked a protest at the Gentle Mantra. However, the bill was left following the massive this protest and dissolution of the 16th Lok Sabha. Condemning the possibility of passing the bill again in the winter session of the parliament, the MC submitted a letter to the government of Manipur uh, against the intention of the central government to introduce it again. It called for a 15-hour total shutdown. <clears throat> However, the union parliament passed the citizenship amendment bill. Many student volunteers of the MC were arrested to suppress their voices in the last part of the 2019. Lastly, it is worthwhile mentioning that the union has played a commendable role in the fight against the drug abuse and alcoholism. It stood directly against increasing cases related to the crime against women and children. 
So uh, to conclude, it becomes obvious that the M2 has a keen desire to take part in the social political issues for a better society. Uh, since its inception, it has traveled a long journey, and it is hoped that it will continue to struggle as the real driving force for the bright future of Manipur. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Marco. Thank you, sir. Uh, can uh, Mr. Mausan tell me, uh, you, we should have all the questions on the all presentations after, or we should have a presentation after each paper? After each paper. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. At, the, at, the, at the end of the session, sir. All okay. Four the presenter, yeah, that's why. All that's right. why. Because we are running uh, uh, late. Uh, yes. So, uh, now I request... Uh, Another paper presenter to present his paper on tribal health care uh, problem in India. Yes, sir. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Dr. H. L. Chowda is the yes. head department of sociology. Yes, from uh, Maharaja Krishna Kumar C. G. Bhavnagar University, Bhavnagar, Gujarat. Gujarat. Yes. yes. So, Professor Chowda. Um, those, those who are not speaking, please put your mic on mute mode because unmuted mic uh, is creating uh, noise. Uh, Professor Chawada. Professor Chavra, are you on the line? Professor H. L. Chavra. Okay, we will, uh, uh, since he is not on the line or he is not able to present. Yeah, sure. Should I call someone else, sir? Yeah, next in the line, I will request uh, Mr. Horam. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Horam, you can uh, start your paper. The title of his paper is uh, Development Challenges uh, in Northeast India Towards a New Perspective. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, respecting the chairperson of the session, Professor Kumar, and my fellow participants. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mung Reshang Horam, and I'm currently pursuing my PhD in the Department of Political Science, Manipur University. And I'll be giving a brief oral presentation. So let me just jump to my uh, topic. The topic of my presentation is development. Yes, sir. Development. Uh, Sorry. Uh, Professor Hawara, you can present next. Uh, because since Mr. Horam has a started presentation. Uh, okay, okay, no, sir. Uh, so, Professor Chawada, you can start. You can come next, please. Okay. Huh? Okay. okay. Yeah. So, the topic of my presentation is developmental challenges in Northeast India towards a new perspective. As we all know, Northeast India is situated in a strategic location along India's eastern frontier, which is in close proximity with Southeast Asia. For this, Northeast India is known as the gateway to the East. <clears throat> Moreover, Northeast India is in, endowed with many natural resources. So such char characteristics has given Northeast India an enormous potential for growth and development. However, Northeast India is one of the least developed regions of India. This is because of the plethora of problems and challenges which has hindered the development process and inhibiting the unlocking of the potentials of the region. So, let us examine some of the problems and challenges and the factors responsible for the uh, underdevelopment of the region. The first point is that <coughs> the landlocked nature and isolation of Northeast India from main, mainland India, along with the top topography of the region, which, <coughs> which is associated with its hilly nature and lots of natural calamities like landslide and all, <coughs> affects the infrastructural development and connectivity in, networks in the region. The, these things inhibits <coughs> in investments and development of industries in the region. The second point is the ethnic complexity of the region. 
which has led to insurgency, uh, ethnic violence, and many other problems in the region. <coughs> uh, these things has led to violence and pol political inst instability in the region, which has hindered the development process. Moreover, uh, there is also the existence of a persistent perceived fear and threats from outsiders, which, uh, <coughs> as we have witnessed in the uh, inner line permit movements. So these things have de deterred investments and hindered the development process in the region. Uh, moreover, the ethnic conflict and divide within the Nordistan uh, society uh, between different states of the northeastern uh, North region has prevented the emergence of uh, economic regionalism within the northeast region. Uh, my next point is uh, the security-centric approach to dealing with the peculiar issues and challenges in the northeast region has led to the excessive militarization of the region which has led to violence and political instability moreover the neighborhood policy of india and the larger foreign policy of india is <coughs> dictated by the security concerns which has affected uh, prospects for cross-border engagement in relations with the neighboring countries thus with all this underdevelopment of the region and the lack of industries and investments which has led to the uh, lack of effective presence of the and the role of market in the economy of the northeast region most of the northeastern regions most of the northeastern states have become dependent on the transfer of funds from the center so their economy have become dependent and exist as mere consumers of resources so all of things all of these things have made it necessary to re-examine the development strategy and approaches uh, in dealing with the uh, problems and challenges in the region. So, in order to overcome those challenges and in order to usher in development in the region, certain policies have to be adopted. So I have uh, made an observation and I have suggested certain points for, uh, ex uh, for accelerating the development process in the Nordic region. So the first point, I have made is that is the promotion of local economy. In order to tap the potential of the region, the focus should be on developing industries based on the local resources of the region. Northeast India has certain comparative advantage in terms of uh, agro processing industries due to its uh, uh, topography and the natural vegetation of the region. Well, Moreover, uh, Northeast India has certain advantages in terms of uh, industry space of indigenous tribal handicrafts and handlooms. <coughs> the Northeast region is also a region where there is lots of creativity, creativity and talents in the fields of sports, music, etc. So these potentials have to be properly tapped and nurtured in order to create productive employment opportunities for the region, which will help accelerate the development of the region. Uh, the next point is ensuring participatory development. In order to bring in development in the region, there is a need to empower the people and ensure their participation in the development process, which will ensure long-term development for the development of the region. So the people should be involved in determining and adoption of the policies and approaches towards the development of the region. The next point is providing safe and conducive environment for businesses. In order to dispel the psychological inhibitions of potential investors and entrepreneurs to set up industry and make investments in the region, the people of the region must find ways to learn, to accept and welcome outsiders. States and state governments and civil societies also have the responsibility to provide such a safe and conducive, conducive environment for outsiders and also for uh, setting up businesses and uh, industries in the region. Such pro-investment and pro-business climate will help stimulate the economy of the region. And the next pro uh, point I would suggest is 
the promotion of economic realism, originalism. As we all have witnessed, uh, the ethnic divide and the existence of age-old ethnic schism uh, between different societies in the region and also between different states in the region has hampered the prospects for economic cooperation between northeastern states. So efforts must be made for ensuring economic interdependence, cooperation, and partnership towards the objective of uh, having a common economic development for the region. And the next point is the need for the securitization of the northeastern region. Instead of uh, following a narrow security-centric approach to the ethno-political issues in the region, efforts must be made towards finding lasting solutions to the issues and challenges of the regions. This can be done by <coughs> replacing the state-centric security perspective with a people-centric developmental approach. Moreover, <coughs> the need for demilitarization of India's borders and uh, the border areas of the Nordic region is necessary because uh, cross, uh, through cross-border cooperation and sub-regional uh, initiatives with neighboring countries, uh, the Nord uh, Nordic India can make full advantage of its geographical proximity with Southeast Asia towards the development and growth of the region. So the next point is the trans uh, transnational approach towards development of the region. Owing to its geographical location, in, which is in close proximity with India's neighboring Eastern countries and with Southeast Asia, uh, the transnational approach to the development of the Northeast is one of the best uh, available strategies for the development of the region. The geographical proximity of the Northeast region with Southeast Asia provides avenues for strengthening connectivity and economic integration of the region with Southeast Asia. The existence of uh, age old ethnic cultural ties with, uh, of the region with some Southeast Asian countries comes at an, as an advantage, added advantage in this respect. So because of these things, Northeast India has uh, enormous prospects in terms of uh, I mean Northeast India can serve as a transport co corridor for trade and tourism by connecting with Southeast Asia. Moreover, Northeast India has the potential to serve as a manufacturing hub together with the less developed economies of Southeast Asia. Uh, Northeast India has also many potential in terms of education, healthcare and tourism, tourism sector uh in relation with the neighboring countries so real, realizing this potential of the northeast region uh the northeast india has been integrated in india's look east policy in its later phase uh the shift from the look east policy to act east policy in 2014 has uh given an added emphasis on the role of the northeast and the consideration of the developmental needs of the region in India's act is policy. However, despite such measures, uh, despite such measures and potentials of the act is policy for Northeast India, it has been offset by the infrastructural lack of infrastructural development and other development deficits in the region. So, act is policy in actual practice seems to have been largely remained a policy in initiative benefiting the rest of the country. So in, the, in order to unlock the potential of the region and take advantage of the Northeast India's geographical proximity with Southeast Asia and other neighboring Eastern countries, uh, there is a need to integrate, fully integrate the Northeast India in India's act as policy. Uh, instead of just being a, res a rhetoric uh, one of the main objectives of the Act East policy should be towards propelling, propelling the growth and development of the region. With this, I conclude my uh, brief presentation. Thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Horam, for your very, very important presentation. Uh, we, will, we will have discussions 
after two more papers are presented. Uh, now I request Professor Chawda. Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Sorry, uh, we we were not getting you, so I gave uh, Mr. Horam the chance. Uh, no, no, it's okay, sir. It's okay, sir. Sorry for keeping you waiting. No, no, it's okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my paper is titled "Tribal Health Care Problem in India: A Sociological Overview." Uh, we know health is a prerequisite of human development and is an essential component for the well-being of mankind. The common belief, custom, practice related to health and disease is done influence the health of human being. Health can be regarded as a state of mental, social and economic well-being and not to mere absence of disease. Health is a function not only of medical care but also of the overall integrated development of society, cultural, economic, educational, social and political. Therefore, to have sound health, the other depending factors are also to be looked into. Despite remarkable worldwide progress in the field of diagnostic and curative and preventive health, still there are people living in isolation is natural and uploaded surrounding far away from civilization with their traditional values, custom, belief and myth impact. They are commonly known as tribal it is. Fascinating that tribal is Indian constitute one 10.28 million as per our 2011 census which is about 8.61 percentage of the total population of India. There are some communities among tribal who have been designed at a primitive based on pre-agricultural level of technology, low level of literacy, segment of discrimination population size, relative circulation from the mainstream of population, economic and educational backwardness, extreme poverty, dueling in remote essential hilly trains, maintenance of constant touch with the natural environment and unaffected by the developmental process undergoing in India. Uh, now we clear tribal health culture. The culture of community determines of the health behavior of the community in general and individual member in particular. The health behavior of the individual is closely linked to the way of or the she perceives various health problems. The early healing treatment were derived from the surrounding environment of humans who were forest dwellers. They made use of planet, animals and other substances naturally available then treat illness. Complex health her healthcare system of the simple societies evolved based on the deep observation of the nature and environment. The medical system is simple society is structured on the illness of herbal and psychometric treatment. The healing practices include a touch of mythism, supernatural and magic. Wrestling specific magic religious rites etc. Faith healing has always been a part of the traditional treatment in the tribal health care system, which can be equated with report of confidence building in the modern treatment produce. In most tribal communities, there are folklore associated with health beliefs. Now, studies by anthropologists indicated that traditional medicines to exist and process even through the health consumer have no access to western medicine. There is a need to significantly study of the traditional tribal medicine and healing system and combine them with modern allopathic system to say make it available and affordable for poor tribal population. Now we discuss tribal health problem. The tribes in India were distinct health problem mainly governed by multi-dimensional factors such as a habitat difficult terrains, varied ecological illiteracy, poverty, isolation, superstition and deforestation. The tribal people in India have their own lifestyle, food habits, belief, tradition and sociocultural activities. Health and nutrition problem of vast tribal population are worried because of well-draining 
diversity in their socio economic cultural and ecological setting uh, first this is burden among the tribal so health and nutrition problem of the vast tribal population of india are as worried as the tribal groups themselves who present a below daring diversity and variety in their socio economic socio cultural and ecological settings apart from conventional disease which occur due to interventional of disease causing agent directly some other factors also result in ill health among the tribals the tribal people live in close consumption to the nature as compared to non tribes hence the adverse effect of climate change is an active as well a potential there threat to them second communicable disease the people is their daily life consciously or subconsciously modify the environment and ecological aspect of their habitat which is turn increase the risk for communicable disease the communication of disease is dependent either the direct contact or on the indirect agents like breathing sputum stool saliva urine it is there are several communicable disease prevent among the tribal of india these are tuberc tuberculosis hepatitis sexually treatment disease malaria chlorosis diarrhea and dietary problem parasitical infection viral and fungal infection conjunctivity is ear scabs leprosy cough and cold hiv aids which is spreading like wildfire it is due to lack lack of sanitation and unhygienic living they frequently become victim of repeated epidemics of above mentioned contagious disease poor diet and nutrition in hasis sub consciousness of communication who identifies disease based as lack of personal and domestic hygiene overcrowded living are also the positive factors responsible for this kind of disease then non communicable disease a uh, lack of proper health education proper poverty faculty nebreeding habits and irrational beliefs aggravate the health and nutritional status of their under privileged people in india it is accepted that the increase in literacy rate of community would reduce morbidity and child mortality of on their words improve the health status of the community as well all tribal diets are generally grossly deficient in calcium vitamin a vitamin c riboflavin and animal protein micronutrient deficiency is closely linked with nutritional disorder and diarrhea deficiency of essential dietary component leads to malnutrition protein calorie calorie deficiency and micro nutrient deficiency like white uh, vitamin a iron and iodine deficiency uh, then women health women health among tribals is a grossly neglected concept almost all tribal women follow on hygienic practice as far their maternal health is concerned nutritional anemia is a major problem for women in india and more so in the rural and tribal belt this is particularly serious in view of the fact that both rural and tribal women have heavy workload and anemia has profound effect on psychological and physical health maternal malnutrition is a quite common among the tribal women especially those who have many pregnancies to closely expected child bearing improves additional health need to problem on women physically psychology and socially the chief causes of maternal mortality were found to on hygienic and primitive practice for per nutrition some crude birth practice were found the exist in various tribal group like karias god santhal putia khonds santhal ija donars it is 
the habit of taking alcohol during pregnancy has been found to be visible in tribal women and almost all they are observed to continue their regular activities including hard labor during advanced pregnancy as far as child is concerned both rural and tribal illiterate mothers are observed to breastfeed their babies but most of adopt harmful practice like discarding of polar storms giving practical feeds delay intination of breastfeeding and delayed introduction to complementary feeds then genetic disorders hereditary hematological and genetically disordered especially sickle cell disease hemoglobin apathies and poly hemolytic disorders are important public health problem and occur in high frequencies among different tribal groups and scheduled caste population this result is a high degree of morbidity and mortality due to hemolytic is valuable population above 13 lakh deficient are percent in tribal population prevalence rate up to 40% of sickle cell that has been reported in some tribes at like it adian irula panian gods sickle cell gen is a widely prevalent among the tribal population in india they have been investigated in over 100 tribal populations spread over different part of the country the prevalence rate varies widely 0.5 to 45% among different tribes interestingly this gen is restricted among the tribe of central western southern and the eastern india and is conceptually totally absent in north east india there are many primitive tribes who have been identified to be high risk group then now i come in conclusion health is a principle of human development and is a essential important of the well being of mankind the culture of community determined and the health behavior of the community in general and individual members in particular of tribes in india health district health problem mainly governed by multi dimension factor in the society health and nutrition problems tribal population indian there are several communicable disease prevalent among the tribes on of indian women health among tribal is a grossly neglected concept in society hereditary and genetically health problems in the society sexually transmitted disease are most prevalent disease in the tribal areas in india okay thank you now it's over thank you uh, thank you professor gaura uh, for your very uh, good widely covered uh, discussion in your paper now we will come to the last paper of this session uh, the title of the paper is women and social legislation in colonial india yes. are you on, are you on the line yes sir yes sir gah alaknanda gahir yes sir yes sir okay am i audible yes yes good afternoon everyone my name is alakananda gahir i am mphil research scholar of uh, utkal university bhubaneswar my topic is women and social legislation in colonial india as we all know that women constituted the keystone in the arch of indian society in the 19th century the women question loomed large and this was not a question of what do women want but rather how can they be modernized it became the central questions in the 19th century british india because the foreign rules had focused their attention on the on this particular aspect of society and among with their civilizing mission influential british writers contemned indian religions culture and society for their rules and customs regarding women legislation helped in women's progress from the very beginning of the british rule in india before the arrival of the british in india the position of indian women was deplorable so 
some of the several evils regarding the indian society in the 19th century the most growth occurred with the stunting of women for countless centuries they were kept in utter subjection denied of any right and ignored in all spheres of human activity social evils such as sati female infanticide child marriage polygamy and forced widowhood engulfed the indian society by the last decade of the 19th century there was a recognizable reformist ideology and the shape of this ideology particularly in its view of women was retained throughout much of the 20th century first and foremost indian women to be pitied in 1839 mahesh chandra dev spoke to the society for the acquisition of general knowledge about the daily life of young married women so moved by the humanitarian and egalitarian impulses of the 19th century the social reforms started powerful movement to improve the position of women so legal reforms aimed at improving women's lives lies on slippery terrain so some substantial changes was achieved through legislation in elimination inequalities between men and women so in this we can first discuss that the abolition of sati the term sati means the hindu practice of widow burning of the living widow with the corpses of her husband derived from the sanskrit term for pure or chastity the term sati therefore is a misnomer and sati has come to signify both the act of immolation of a wife on the funeral pyre of her husband and the victim herself rather than its original meaning of a virtuous woman sati is of two types one is sahagamana or keeping company or anumarana dying without the dead body that when a widow burns herself with garment slippers walking stick or with some relic of the deceased so the earliest detailed notice of the self immolation of the sati occurs in the greek account of alexander's invasion some enlightened indian princes had taken step to abolish this cruel practice in their dominions emperor akbar had attempted to restrict it the marathas had forbidden it in their country the portuguese at goa and the french at chandernagar had also taken some step towards its abolition in uh, uh, 1813 the evangelicals in england will be forced and lord tengod had took interest in the abolition of sati and they relied upon the sources given by serampur missionaries william carey and william ward and finally in 1811 Raja Ramon Roy the Bengali reformer witnessed his brother's widow being burned alive on her husband's funeral pyre so 3 years later he retired and concentrated on complaining against the practice of widow dying as sati when lord william bentick took up the question of sati he found that the abolition had been recommended by the judges of the criminal courts so he passed regulations xbia on december 4 1829 the bengal sati regulation for declaring the practice of the burning alive of hindu widow illegal and punishable by the criminal courts after 1830 the cases of sati were very rare and it was virtually stopped in the princely states through their rule rulers corporation next we can discuss about the female infanticide the first uh, british first discovered female infanticide in india in 1789 and jonathan duncan then the resident of banaras province was asked by the bengal council to settle the revenues in the province acquired by the british from the raja of banaras so duncan found during this tour for settling the revenues that the rajkumar rajputs in jonpur district destroyed their female children in fancy side may was mainly confined to the rajputs of baranasi kathiawar kutch jabalpur and sagar so sir john malcolm noticed it in malwa where it was limited to some rajput chiefs of higher classes in fancy side was due primarily to the deplorable position of women in hindu society at the modern some dowry system and the compulsory lavishness in expenditure on marriages and the exorbitant demands of karanas in the difficulty of finding suitable husbands and the rajput sense of honor and pride in uh, 1795 infanticide was declared by bengal regulation act to be murder and the regulation extended to new province in 1804 uh, next we can discuss about the widow remarriage across india there is a long list of reformers who undertook major efforts on women's behalf in in 1828 eight year old iswar chandra vidyasagar joined sanskrit college in calcutta while studying in calcutta he lived at the home of a friend whose sister was a child widow 
This was Ishwar Chandra's first experience of the hardships this custom imposed on women. Some time later, his old gurus decided to marry a young girl. Ishwar Chandra was enraged and demonstrated his anger by refusing his guru's hospitality. Before a year had passed, the guru died and left behind a girl widow with now he had to go and no means of support. So Isha Chandra vowed that no to then to devote his life to improving the status of Hindu widows and encouraging remarriage. So the widow was ill-treated by her in-laws and kinsmen as the virtual destroyer of her husband. She was never allowed to appear cheerful or wear bright clothes or ornaments. So Isha Bindacha uh, Chandra Bidasagar had taken step in this regard. Next in the line is child marriage. Legislative action in prohibiting child marriage uh, came in 1870, popularly known as the Civil Marriage Act of girls below the age of 14 and boys below the age of 18 were forbidden. However, this act was not applicable to Hindus, Muslims and other recognized faiths and as such had very limited impact on Indian society. B.M. Malabari, a Parsi reformer of the 19th century, started a crusade against child marriage, and his efforts were crowned by the enactment of the Ease of Consent Act 1891, which forbade the marriages of girls below the age of 12, and the Sarada Act of 1930 for the push of marriage age and provided for penal action in marriages of boys under 18 and girls under 14 years of age. Next, we can move to education of women. At the beginning of the 19th century, female literacy was extremely low in relation to male literacy and a male literacy ranging from approximately 6% in Bengal to 20% in the Deccan was also low in comparison with Western nation or Japan. Female education was informal and largely limited to practical matters. Women formed respectable families often studied classical or vernacular literature as a peers recreation and girls from propagated from families received some education in keeping accounts. In 1816, the opening of Hindu College, followed by the founding of the Calcutta School Society to promote uh, female education. Radha Kanta Dev, the secretary of this society, became a patron of female education. The Christian missionaries were the first to set up Calcutta Female Juvenile Society in 1819. And in 1849, J.E.T. Bethune, the president of the Council of Education, founded a girls' school in Calcutta. So Isra Chandra Pidasagar also became an impassioned supporter to female education and was associated with no less than 35 girls' school in Bengal. Charles O. Despatch on education 1854 laid great stress on the female education. And in the broad perspective, we can say that the women education become a part of general campaign for amelioration of the plight of women uh, in society. So next one is that abolition of Devadasi system. The Devadasi abolition bill was first introduced by Venkata Rama uh, Iyer in 1927, which is further headed by uh, Muthulakshmi Reddy. The Madras Devadasi Act, also called Tamil Nadu Devadasi Act, is a law that was enacted on 9 October 1947, just after India became independent from British rule. The law was passed in Madras presidency and gave Devadasi the legal right to marry and made it illegal to dedicate girls to Hindu temples. The bill that became the Devadasi Evolution Bill, and before the bill became law, Devadasis were not allowed to marry due to society taboo and were linked to prostitution and immoral occupation by the society, though not necessarily true. In, close, in conclusion, I can say that uh, the reform-minded Indian men were interested in developing a progressive society, and if women were educated, Indian society could be no longer be characterized as decadent and backward. On a personal level, these men yearned for championship and the support and educated women could give them as advanced professionally. And they wanted women to take responsibility for helping the less fortunate members of their communities. And on the lesser level, they envisioned women in charge of social reform while men pursued politics. So introduction of female education paved way for the women's development, empowerment, and emancipation in India. And these measures helped women to gain a laudable place in the society. And it also facilitated the Indian government after independence to devote more attention on women's legislation. Thank you, sir. Very good. Uh, very good, Miss uh, Alka Gahir. Uh, now, friends, the papers are open for discussion. Just you mention your name and your question is addressed to uh, which paper uh, you mention that.
Anybody who wants to know anything more on the papers presented, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Because I could not see this uh, any question in the chat box. Okay, friend, since nobody is coming, so I will wind up uh, and give my uh, presidential comment in very brief. Pardon? Anybody? No, sir, no one actually. Yeah. No one. So, so I will wind up in few minutes. Uh, the first paper, which was by, which was on a student uprising in Manipur, uh, and the paper presenter very nicely uh, presented the issue in historical perspective, and he brought the issue up to CA protest and ILP and so many uh, uh, contemporary issues, and. Uh, uh, this is this is very good approach because when we bring historical with contemporary relevance i will i will come to it on other papers also especially uh, when i discuss paper wise but uh, uh, mr marco singh uh, presented nicely when in historical perspective he was bringing all manipur students union uh, into contemporary uh, movement or contemporary I don't want to use the work, uh, word uprising uh, because uprising, revolt, these are very value laden terms. And if we see uprising, uh, uh, there, there are various uh, connotations in it. So I will, I will address this as a movement uh, that coming to uh, NTCA or pro ILP uh, moves. Uh, the uh, Mr. Singh uh, discussed an, an important aspect in his paper. Another paper also on the development challenges in Northeast India again from Manipur. Uh, he discussed it very nicely, situating geopolitical condition of Northeast India and bringing it to from look east to act east. Act east. And just I can tell you, friends, here, as a student of history who has little knowledge of Northeast India and, and Southeast Asia, the way transnational approach or transnational moves for the development of Northeast India, he, he was suggesting that was really good. And I have studied in my uh, researches that how transnational approach can be uh, adopted because this these boundaries are purely British created modern political boundaries and modern political boundaries because of British creation has suddenly created more hindrance than the composite development. Like if you see the partition of India, uh, uh, if organizers give me two minutes, two more minutes, then whole Bangladesh, the, the boundary creation between Meghalaya and Burma, uh, Bangladesh, the whole foothills, either you say War Khasi or you say War Jayantia, the people of those regions, either of Indian side or of Bangladesh side, or people of Tirpura and other areas, they were depending for several things traditionally in the markets which are now in Bangladesh. So that kind of transnational approach, what uh, uh, the paper presenter was uh, suggesting, uh, really very good. And his uh, suggestions were very, very pragmatic uh, suggestions. Uh, historically, we have evidence, and I can I can give you hundreds of example of history and how traditionally this development was there. Only thing is, what he lacked, like contemporary, 
sustainable sustainable development suppose we establish an industry how those industries will be sustainable and how those industries will be ecological and environmental friendly uh, that dimension is also important because we have seen the uh, coal mining in uh, meghalaya and other areas star cement and other cement factories and we have seen the environmental and ecological impact of this so so uh, while discussing development we should also not lose our focus on ecological and environmental dimension uh, because overall people's life is largely guided by ecological and environmental condition and and we cannot neglect ecology environment for a longer period you you see in canada what is happening last one week other parts of india rain so uh, that dimension in another paper uh, if he can uh, look into uh, like i will give you the example of dams for development generation of electricity government of india is developing dams all over northeast india and these dams are against whole ecological environmental system because northeast india comes under very high seismic zone but government of india is bound to tap the resources of northeast india the water resources it generate electricity but the life of the people nobody takes care of it so uh, this kind of uh, discussion if he takes up in his next paper uh, in on other occasion that will be very nice uh the third paper by professor uh, gaura was very good very interesting paper that is still in uh, 75 years of independence large number of tribal population in several parts of india or better to say other parts of the world also are not able to have the health care facility however uh some missionaries either you say this missionary that missionary uh, uh, some like ram krishna mission or christian mission wherever in tribal areas those missionaries were able to arrive early they came with their health mission and because of their health mission in some of the areas i am not talking all over india but in some of the areas health mission became very very uh, uh, very very popular in the tribal areas uh, so that dimension is also there and gradually education and employment has brought health consciousness even among the women uh, so uh, the the issue of missionaries uh, and the miss uh, issues of education and uh, uh, employment of women uh, if Uh, that dimension comes into uh, his next paper that will be very good otherwise his paper was very nice uh, very timely that is still after 75 years of indian independence uh, health care has not reached to the tribal villages and tribal areas uh, the last but not the least uh, very important paper on women and social legislation in colonial india was very very good very timely paper uh, and uh, uh, miss uh, alka or alaknanda she she did a very fine job broadly she brought into central legislation and and the discussion on this and how uh, this proved to be a prime mover in social transition because of women's education women's employment consciousness among the women not only help the women individually but his her family her society and nation at large because gandhian movement could attract large number of women and gandhian movement brought empowerment also to women because women were coming in the forefront 
सो लेजिस्लेशन एट द वन एंड सोशियो कल्चरल एंड पोलिटिकल कंसनेस ऑन द वन एन अदर दीज टू हेल्प इन द इम्प्रूवमेंट ऑफ द वुमेन्स पोजिशन एंड वुमेन्स कंसनेस जस्ट आई विल एड टू मिस अलकनंदा गाहिर्स त्रिपुरा राजा also abolished both sati was banned by him vir uh, uh, manikya and uh, slavery was also abolished by him so when sati was abolished in late 19th century uh, and and sati was also abolished so that kind of development we also have in quote and quote areas of northeast india so so that dimension uh, 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 though not under british colonial legislation but we have legislation also in uh, north east india regarding this uh, so with this uh, i will i will uh, uh, close my part uh, discussion and thank you all for uh, giving me the opportunity especially to the organizers of the seminar and for the, to the paper presenters who from north east india uh a uh, tribal areas and uh, social legislation did a wonderful job in presentation of paper thank you all thank you very much